shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast interview special. Today, Tom and I are here with director Chris Cronin. We talked to him, or excuse me, we talked about his film, The More, a while back. And this was a film we had to le- learn a little bit more about, especially the, some of the behind the scenes and the nuts and bolts of it. So, uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. No, thanks for having me, guys. It was a treat to watch The More and it visually especially we love the way this film looked well it's 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 an interesting one. well my brother actually is the cinematographer on it i think everybody always goes i don't want to assume they're related <laughs> <laughs> it'd be a coincidence if they weren't um so it's really strange that we were looking at the moor and depending on where you point the camera it looks like what you get in the film yeah or it looks like a soccer pitch if you want to put it <laughs> it's just flat and then white sky and we're just stood there on a field going this is a field how are people going to be scared of a field and then you wait 15 minutes pointing in a slightly different direction and you go oh wow okay we, we i believe we even commented in the show that the more itself appeared to be a character unto itself because of, it had changing moods depending on when you were shooting and which direction well, it's weird. It's one of those, I don't want to say repeat viewing, but it benefits from, which is the the Moor is acting like a character. That was very intentional. And the weather has intention. So there's certain, one of my favorite bits is when they go up, you know, one more time and then the weather just kind of says, you know what I am. <laughs> I'm not going to hide anymore. <laughs> we're going to look, we're going to look as sinister as, as we want. Like, so as a director and you're directing a film, you didn't write the film. It was written by Paul Thomas. Mm. When he comes with a, a, a script with something like that, with something like the more that plays such an important part in the story and everything. I mean, that has to be a little daunting of a task. It, it's not just, okay, I got to get these people in a room together and get them to perform or whatever. You now have to be like, create this atmosphere and everything with a geographical location that yeah and, and for, forgive me if i'm wrong was this your first feature length film yeah it's my first it's my debut feature it's a debut feature film yeah yeah so yeah you i feel like you kind of jumped in both feet with this well how else do you want to do it i guess <laughs> like, <laughs> like i That's think fair. if you um yeah, if you were like let's shoot this all in my garage unless it's you know really 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 gripping acting and stuff like I need some toys to play with, even if the toys want to hurt me and give me pneumonia. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So me and the writer, we didn't know each other as kids. We met each other at the end of our university life, but we both grew up around the Moors. So we knew its presence, you know, you know, the, the, the you know, the folklore aspect that, you know, the, the things the kids make up about the Moors and then the real events that took place. So we, we always considered it a bit of a boogeyman anyways. So combining that with the love, my personal love of Eldritch locations in movies. So I, I really get a kick out of a really good, interesting Eldritch location. It was kind of ripe for it, but um, Paul had it as a treatment, but we spent most of lockdown tailoring it so paul's really good writer in terms of he'll he will not bring me anything i wouldn't really want to make so i've known him for a lot of years and he goes i think there's elements of this you'll get a kick out of let's let's work and make it something you would want to make so it's definitely paul's writing but there was a lot of for a good six months of conversations trying to make it fit something he would like to put his name to and consider his writing as well as something i would like to direct so yeah then you put in, and we had to, we commented on it on the uh, on the review, and it's something to bring up again is the cast that yes. we end up on this more with. I mean, you no. could have a fantastic setting, and if you don't have the right cast, 
eh, it's gonna it's just gonna <laughs> look like ground <laughs> well, yeah, yeah well yeah you're right i think there's there's two points to that so the first one that me and the writer who's also a producer alongside me other producer pavo prax um it doesn't cost anything to have a good story or good performances but it's it's going to be the main thing that that pulls people in if you do a good job of it so it's kind of like if you've got a good cast and a good story that's a lot of the work you know aesthetically you could if, if we had a, a crappy camera but you believed the acting and you you cared about the story you'd be okay still so we're like as a no as a low budget movie what can we do to to, to make people feel like it's more than it is and that was one aspect that we took as a high priority yeah, the casting process was a large part of that. It was it was very 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 important. Um, I forgot the other part of the question. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was just a, more of a statement, just a, yeah. a comment on the fact that we thought the cast was really helped carry the film. Like I said, because otherwise it would just be well, yeah, that looks pretty or it looks creepy, but it's just people playing around in it. No, the oh. cast really carries it and uh, and carries the story and keeps the audience intrigued throughout the entire process no that's all that's awesome no thank you um i think as a film I'm, this is self-admitted as well when you get into filmmaking you get obsessed with the toys what can this lens do what can this camera do <laughs> and when you realize you can you can get a really high functioning lens and the acting is wooden it's still <laughs> rubbish and so I, as I got older and mature i started to focus on that side of things and so when we were right, because you can't write dialogue and then expect an actor to pull it off. You have to have a really good actor that can pull off dialogue as well. So Paul wrote confidently knowing we would find the right cast and I would be able to work with the cast. That's as, that's as braggy as I'll ever get, by the way. <laughs> but I've I spent a lot of years working at drama schools, helping students become, so they used to do a lot of theater and I helped them work for camera. So I used to, that was, I learned the language of actor, which some directors don't, they go, they learn the language of lenses and lighting. So yeah, it was really, it was really helpful that I could, me and the actors could really communicate, especially with some of these heavy topics and heavy themes, which are not always present in the dialogue. It's all, you know, sometimes it's subtext, sometimes it's just a look, sometimes, sometimes it is a monologue, you know what I mean? But it, 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 there's a lot to it there. It is very character driven, as you said, so it, it was very reliant on the actor. If the actors weren't great, then we just sank. No, and you guys did very well with that. Um, a, honestly, for a first feature uh, opportunity and I, what I assume was a lower budget overall, um, it gave a lister kind of presence to it. They everyone was very believable and, and very in the moment of each of the scenes. Well, hello, Tom. <laughs> I guess that's the bit you leave. Yeah, it was really no, it was really fun to listen to you guys talk about the film. Um, because and I think what's really interesting about it, no, I, I appreciate what you're saying, is yeah. that it's gonna be one of those divisive films as well, isn't it? Sure. Like, so so Christopher was going to back when right? all the things you said I liked about it, and you're like, well, this 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 this, this, this. and I, I didn't listen to that and go, why well, would he say it? I was like, <laughs> interesting, interesting. <laughs> and we seem to be pulling in like true crimers as well as horror fans and so we i think we're fortunate that we're going to lean into both aisles but at the same time equally frustrate people who came for one thing so mm -hmm. you know I've, yeah. I've had so many people go i don't usually watch horror but i really enjoyed it until the end and you go <laughs> it's a horror like it's going yeah. we're always going to go there no i had a very classic horror ending but uh, yeah no I, I, that was the perspective i was taking through it is like this is a couple of types of movies mm. in one. And you start off with that true crime feel that what happened, what happened, what happened to Danny, what happened uh, when we learn a little bit more that there is an identified killer and he's in jail. Yeah. And, and now there's a possibility of release. It's feeling like that. And then we start shifting into the, the almost seance style of stuff. And then we transition to demons and ghosts and stuff uh, out on the moor. And, and uh, like, there's a couple of films in here. <laughs> we, maybe we planted them a little too subtly, but yeah, it's um, what's really interesting is one of the main things the writer Paul Thomas was really interested in is, is that slow burn uh, 70s. So I obviously do love the 70s style horrors. So I, you know, 
I, I, I can't talk about The Exorcist without repeating what anybody else has already said. But every time I need to go watch, like, feel like horror vibes, want to write something, I have to go watch The Exorcist first to cleanse my palate, and then I'll watch some new stuff. So I, he came from, like, the dot, which is kind of timing's quite apt at the moment. Don't look now. Um, Paul took a lot of influence from that, where you're just kind of wondering, is anything going on? Like, when is, you know, what's really going on? And then that and that ending just slaps you in the face and then the credits roll and you go, what? So, <laughs> Paul, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's not... No, he, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it was his date night movie. He freaked the person out. <laughs> <laughs> so he told me. I think that's why it had such an effect on him. He was like, huh? But um, mine was The Wicker Man, which is another British okay. horror. Mm-hmm. And it had a profound effect on me as a kid. So that's how we kind of connected on the material. So... I I was like, why would you do that to an audience member? Like, there's a good man trying to save this girl, and not only are you going to do a horrible thing to him, we're all going to sing Kumbaya and dance around it. Like, <laughs> I was affected by that. And I showed this the moor to my uh, a writer, horror writer friend, and she was one of the first people to see it, and she goes, oh, your film gave me film grief. And I was like, oh, film that's grief. that's where I felt. I, I, yeah. That's hers, TM, um, <laughs> Lucy Rose, TM. But um, she said film grief. And I went, oh, but there's a certain type of horror movie that creates a bit of film grief where you just go, oh, like that didn't sit. I didn't get closure there. I'm a little unhappy. And hopefully the right reasons. And I was like, okay, that's what I was chasing. For the true crime aspect crossing over into horror, I think it's that result of trying to do that slow burn like we're gonna slowly descending to hell but because because maybe the mystery and the crime aspect was kind of in its own right interesting and gripping i think when we tailored away from that everybody was like no 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 no, get back to the cold case so (laughs) um but it was never intended to be that i think maybe we did too good job of one thing and and it kind of promised more than it should like we you know I'd, i'd love to do a true crime um not true crime, but I'd love to do a crime thriller with a bit of teeth, but this was always intended to be a horror. And, but I remember the certain scenes go, we could do it. It's like, no, 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 save it, save it, save it. And you're like, okay, okay. Well, no, sitting with the material longer and all that, I mean, it, it's natural in our world that if you, you are going to introduce some sort of paranormal element, everybody is going to try everything in their ability to explain it in any other way up until it's right in their face. So the no, the notion of having that slow burn over the crime drama component and then taking it in this direction, I'm feeling better with that overall now. And and, and but it's funny you mentioned the the that whole uh, that surprise end that 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 film grief. That's the I think I commented at one point it had that Blair Witch Project kind of feel there at the I end. I had film grief, yeah, 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 yeah. Where you, you're just left with this one scene, you get to know nothing after that, and, and you're like, "Well, that was terrifying," but uh, now I kind of want to know what else. Happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't it like, isn't it? You can only do that in horror as well. You because, can because if you explain, I know that people want answers. That's and you want to give some answers, but not all. And if I tell you exactly what the Moore's intention is and I explain what the Moore did and why it did it, you would be a little less frightened by the Moore now. Like if, if I explain why the woods are creepy, you'd be like, well, I don't fear the woods as much anymore. If it's still unexplained, it's still out there and it could still get you. And I think you can only do that in horror. In thriller, I think that'd be quite unsatisfying because um, it's all about that. Um, so, you know, I'll stand by it. I'm like, if the more is creep, if you got actually the more really unsettled me that the actual location, I think it's because you know, it's a presence in itself, but you mm-hmm. don't know why it's doing what it is, but there is clues in there. Cause the writers, the writer loves to be his little subtleties. He's, he's, there's a lot of repetitive things in repeat viewings. I think why it worked so well for me and why I found it effective was you know, being it, it started out in a very grounded reality. This was a world we live in. We we hear about kidnappings. It's something we can relate to. Slowly, you get pulled into the 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 more fantasy aspects into the supernatural. I think that's important. If you go into a film and immediately it's obvious that it's a horror and it's supernatural, it's like immediately you're in fantasy world. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a little less the fear factor drops down a little bit. 
Whereas a film starts out kind of slow and does the slow burn like in the more, it pulls you in and it 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 makes you uncomfortable in the end and everything because it, it's slowly taking you out of your comfort zone and it puts you into that 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 space that uh that suddenly it's the creepy world yeah. <laughs> that you weren't well, expecting. Well, it's hopefully it makes it feel a bit more like you, like you said, horrible that you think this is happening to real people in a real world instead of that mm-hmm. heightened reality. So this is not a body count movie, is it? It's not a slasher. No. So, like I said, going back to if the story and characters resonate with you, which is you know something that doesn't cost money, it just costs time and effort and hard work. Um, you will follow them into the dis- you know well, the descent. So it was very intentional to go. Let's create something very real and raw and emotional and. I would say relatable, but I think, you know, every kid knows what it's like to not get that hug from a parent or to not feel like you're you're doing everything you can as a parent, um, you know, on a heightened level, which is genre. Um, it kind of puts you in the shoes a little bit. Like the opening sequence, as you've, it's very grounded in reality. There's not much supernatural stuff going on there at all. But to any right. parent, that's like the parent's worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. So it was just how do you take something as grounded as that and to slowly turn up the temperature on the horror in a supernatural way? Because you always want to do those those great openers where you set the tone. And if I had, you know, something very obviously supernatural in the beginning, then how do you escalate beyond that point? Because I don't have the budget to do a full army of ghosts or anything <laughs> like that. i got to leave it all to suggestion and make it seem intentional. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I liked it because there's there's the father trope in horror, isn't there? Where the father, you know, turns on the family. You got the Shining, the Amateurville horror, which is again that great era of horror. Yeah, and it's like how do we take that trope and make it feel like fresh again? And and I'm not. It's because I'm like I see like a good horror is like those trains on train tracks where it's always going to go to that destination. The film's telling you it's going to end that way but you're still going maybe there's a left turn we can take maybe the characters will do something different and you go no this is horror it's slow it's going to happen it's going to get you like like Voorhees it's going to get you so yeah Voorhees very nice (laughs) now right now I know that it's only available unfortunately in the UK not unfortunately it's available in the UK it's not unfortunately it's not available here in the States yet (laughs) Put that in the right way. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. Get it's there. Fine. But I know it it did a uh, a round of uh, festivals. Were yeah. the festivals only in the UK or were those worldwide? They were pri- primarily in the UK. They have traveled because it's with a sales agent now. Because we're an indie film, like we were just trying to get it out there. Yeah. Um, so now it's up to the sales agents to to put it out there and do what they want with it but it has it has it's, it's about a year old now isn't it but it's shown at some really big places like fright fest who have i don't know if you guys have heard of it in the us but um it's a really big horror festival on the world festival circuit and they've really championed it because there was no we we've got no studio backing there's no famous producer behind this there's no industry contact that's going to go i know a guy so fright fest have this really great um section of the festival called the first blood strand and they find if there's good enough talent in a first feature they push you up to the top and go look how great this new talent is and it's done nothing but great great things for us really um so yeah it's it's almost like we could go straight to distribution based on that um so we've got UK distribution and our sales agents taking care of the rest. I'd love for it to, you mentioned uh, indie cinemas and stuff like that in the US. I'd love that, but we were worried about, we're well, not worried, but we were very interested in, in terms of, so there's a lot of influence of actual history in the UK for the Moors and it's a Moors location. It's a UK location mm-hmm. and we made mm-hmm. it Northern. Like I said to other people, I didn't see that as a, as a, Uh, a barrier i see that as no different than stephen king's you know Maine, where you go i've never been to Maine, right well i've never seen the story told in Maine. i want to know what the diners look like i want to know what everybody's homes look like it's a new vibe of it Mm -hmm. and i just wanted to do that with the corner shop bill's house the locations i'm like it is a horror film but in a different location maybe that will interest people so but then you go what's he going to translate like in the u.s but for the people who have reviewed it in the US, it's gone down almost overwhelmingly positive, which is very shocking to me. 
Uh, it's pleasantly shocking, but they say they compare it to like the Texas Killing Fields. There's 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 relatable locations in the U.S. where they go. We get it. It's just a different different vibe. Well, and as we mentioned in the uh, in the review, we're talking about the Moors. It, it's not um, uniquely British, at least the idea of mm. the Moors. It, it's something that's been in cinema. It's been in television. Uh, we, I joked about Scooby Doo, but you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah. it's it, it's that sort of thing. Sherlock Holmes. You know, the Moors are definitely one of those places that you're not supposed to go. There's always danger on the Moors. So it is something that even if we we don't have them in our backyard you know, or outside of our town, you know, the image is is still there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I literally had someone come to me and goes, Oh, you should do this. You should do a remake of the Withering Heights. And I'm like, What? Like, <laughs> just because I'm the only guy that's been up there in like 30 years. Like, I'm your only guy. Like, it makes sense when you say a werewolf movie. I'm actually considering that because um, there's actually a big history of um, a, a known werewolf in East Yorkshire. And we're looking into that now. And I'm like, I don't want to go on the moors again. <laughs> well, everybody keeps saying werewolf and I'm joking and laughing it off. And I'm like, my brother, the cinematographer went, what about a genuinely scary werewolf? Cause they used to be genuinely scary. Then they became like horror comedies. Mm-hmm. And there's only ever, there's only ever a sprinkle of like genuine scary werewolves. And I'm like, okay. That's, okay. <laughs> you piqued my interest there. You're yeah, among friendly people when it comes to the werewolves. So you want to make a scary were- werewolf, have at it. Yeah, <laughs> I think cause... we even commented in the show, because that's one thing the U.S. knows the Moors for, is banshees and werewolves. <laughs> yeah, I remember you saying it, yeah. And I'm like, ha, 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 ha. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Withering well, Heights, def- werewolves, which one do I Yeah, think? no, I mean, you could go the Pride, Prejudice, and Zombie kind <laughs> yeah. of version. Uh, the Weathering Heights with werewolves. <laughs> Who knew that crossover was going to be a thing? But, uh, I know, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Get it to do the soundtrack. But no, I, it's something, we, it's one of the, so I, here you go. But I'm looking at mm-hmm. uh, CSI horror, and I'm looking at, a werewolf horror. And so obviously there's two sides to the moor and I'm going to separate them and maybe go off in either one of those directions now, because I love both sides to it. Um, interesting enough, the folk horror aspect of the moor, I don't know if you guys consider it from the U S as a folk horror mm-hmm. <laughs> or intention. It was a cosmic horror. Like It's just because of the location and its history and the, the you know, the, the locale, it just, it just makes it scream folk horror. But a lot of our inspirations was, um, cosmic so it's interesting it's, it's always really interesting how people perceive it i can't it's, it's a lot of fun yes yeah yeah it's it's definitely a film that i think just depending on who watches it they put a lot of their own ideas into it for sure yeah that's what you want with horror up to a point and mm-hmm. the thing is oh, you can't i understand how a film can be frustrating if you don't answer anything but I think there's something about a really interesting question and it's devastating when you got a really bad answer, but it's also a generation. Have you heard of the term second screenable? Uh, not sure. It's going to, it's going to hurt your hearts. So <laughs> there's, there's this, I don't know which streaming services it is. We need, we need films to be second screenable, yeah. which basically means I need to, I need people to be able to follow the plot whilst they're on their phones. Oh, and we are going to fail. Yeah, 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 you are. (laughs) So, what did I miss? I don't know. (laughs) It's funny you mentioned that. I didn't even think anyone came up with a turn, but yeah, I think we all do that thing where we'll have a TV on in the background, but you want something you kind of don't care while you play on your phone. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) this is not that, and nor do I recommend anyone in the office audience please watch this with intent. Yeah, I think we're gonna either you watch us and pay attention, or you'll probably yeah you will you will not. You're like, why are they, what are they doing? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. you'd be in trouble. How'd they get there? Are they still on the moor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they came off. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and here's always my balance with the whole. Uh, I, I know I picked a little bit on the uh, the concept of mm. I, I don't have quite enough information, but I, I always ride this weird balance. The people that you had in the movie, the characters that. Uh, were participating in this story would never have had a way to get answers to various questions. They're not experts in these in these fields. They're not up on all of the lore. At least they didn't appear to be by by the way we were introduced to them. So 
it's logical that whatever horrible thing is happening to them, that they wouldn't necessarily understand it. It's yeah. just me as the third party looking in, wanting a little more to grasp on, especially you got the cool symbol on, on the spire and, and all that. And you're like, that's awesome. This is mean. <laughs> yeah, tell me. Tell me what it means. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and some of that's just my analytical nature. I kind of want to dig in. I no, I, I love that. And if 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 there's a wiki IMDB trivia page, go have at it. Like, tell me. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate that, like legitimately. But at the same time, I we have sprinkled in what we believe is, and there is enough clues if people really want to, like only real true, like fan cinephiles will want to do that. And even then there's room for argument. <laughs> but um I think the issue, so me and Paul, we were always kind of in that camp of whatever you say happened, happened. Because we can't show you the scariest thing ever, but you could imagine it. And if you go, that's the thing that happened that makes you feel shitty, then yes, that's what happened. Because somebody, I remember when I showed it at my local cinema, I got it on a, a showcase, and this guy was like, so the end, this right, and I went maybe, and he goes, "Don't you know?" And I go, "I well, I know what the I know what the logical journey is yeah. that we wrote it without answering, but then I also have an interpretation that I'd like to think. So I know my version the way I told it, but if you don't like that version, the film's shit. <laughs> so he's like, "I think it's this. I'm pretty sure it's this, Chris. You should answer when when people ask you in Q and A, say it's this." And I go. But half the room will go, it's not that, and be yeah. upset that I said it. So I like that idea that what you believe to be the creepy version of it is absolutely true. Um, might not be my truth, but I like that stuff. Because I, I can't. the problem is we can't go into spoilers unless this is, a, this is a spoiler talk. But the ending we changed ever so slightly based on the natural progression of telling the film, that we added a component to kind of even – it's not satisfying. It's meant to be to to be worse, but it it ties up a little loop there as well at the very last frame. So, if you want to talk about that off off mic, I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you want me to tell you, have to. everybody's <laughs> what about. Well, um, we'll, we'll hold. Uh, leave the mystery. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing about anything that is an art form. If there is no interpretation, it's not art. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I used to have a big argument, and going off topic slightly, but you, Blade Runner. Like mm -hmm. Ridley Scott finally came out and said it, he's a replicant. And I went, that undoes all of my philosophies in that movie. He's the he's a human hunting robots that are more human than human. Everybody's a zombie. Robots are truly living. He's experiencing like killing true living creatures, but he doesn't know how to do it. Because no, he's a robot too. You go, oh, robots hunting robots. And I and people will argue with me that that's the right way it should be, but that's not my and I suppose it's still good we're talking about it, but I go, it didn't make it better when you just went, that's what this is. No, completely agree. Yeah, you just took the mystery out of it. I I still want mystery. Don't get me wrong. Your, <laughs> I'm not elements, trying to fight you on this. <laughs> your elements in these films only make me want more information because I'm into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what was it that what was it the bit where you got that I just needed an answer to? I'm very curious. No, it was mostly just uh, the iconography and, mm. and what was uh, what was that supposed to be warning against? I will tell you off mic. You can tell but, me off um, mic. But that semi, there is a reason for that, and there's a, and it's semi inspired by real stones that have those sim similar sure. symbols. They actually are real symbols like that in real life that we tried to interpret and put in the story. So you can go on a moor and you can find them. And See, that's now that's super cool and makes me want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, well, somebody said in a review, like, oh, this is not going to help the Yorkshire tourist board. But I go, if it, if it gets You're wrong, far enough, <laughs> You're wrong. I disagree. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Having, because I actually live in Maryland, I've driven to Burkittsville, Maryland because of the uh, Blair Witch Project movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, and you've, yeah. you've walked the woodlands that they uh -huh. got lost. In. You've been to the house. Is the house real? I, I haven't found the house. <laughs> So I, I I didn't have that kind of time, but there there's even a freaky little thing where you sit on a hill and you put your car in neutral and it'll start to back up <laughs> the hill. It's it, it's one of those funky weird places, but yeah, I, I've gone to that and I walked around because of that. So 
Wrong. Yorkshire's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if it helps, one of the mains, we have multiple locations in the movie, um, but we only shot on the actual moors for like three or four days. Sure. So that's the trickery of it. So we shot on a farm, Pat's farm, just off of a moor in a place called Huddersfield in Yorkshire. And that's where we did all the night scenes with the mist and all that kind of stuff, the tent stuff. But there is one of the most scenic, you know, scenic, but it's like haunting shots of the moor where you do a lot of that is a place called Snakes Pass. And it's, you go up high and the weather changes and you just go, okay. Because we were just like, wait 15 minutes and we might get Hollywood special effects if we're lucky. Yeah. So we, and they go, how did you, because you said like, how did you prepare? Like, were you daunted by all that kind of, and I was like, yes. Like me and the cinematographer were like, this is going to suck. This is really <laughs> going to suck. We're going to be outside. It's going to hurt. And actually in my, in reality, it was the opposite being inside with the, 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 the tone of the movie in a living room with the pendulums and stuff. After a day or two, it just started to get really oppressive in there. <laughs> trapped with an ensemble cast. We all started to like, be miserable but on the moors the wetter it got the more fun i was having i was a little boy um <laughs> but there was a scene so you know you got the cars driving up every time they go to the moor yeah. we were shooting the first version of that and my ad who's pretty switched on was like uh weather report says in about 15 minutes you're gonna get storms like a like a cloud of either rain or fog and I, he was like make a call do you want to drop this scene right now or do you want to prep for that and my brain immediately went and i was like what would i need thick fog for with a vehicle I went, oh, I want it to be cool. And you might not even notice it because it's so subtle. I was like, Exorcist, driving up to the lamppost. Yeah. I was mm-hmm. like, what if I got the car breaking through the fog for the final trip? And it's not that similar, but it's enough for me to go, oh, that's my Exorcist shot. So I was like, I want that. And it's the time that the moor goes, I'm not pretending anymore. You know what I am. I'm just going to be sinister now. <laughs> and we did that within 15 minutes of the first time they went up to the last time they went up. Completely different vibes atmosphere look 15 minutes apart and you have to pay thousands and thousands for that that, I, just- I, that was something i remember uh talking about is the uh all all the fog and and everything that was that was visible in in the shots on the moors is like was that just luck did they run around with a fog machine was it done in post yeah. i mean how yeah. did they oh, so it really was just you just timed the weather patterns it was, it, you know, that, that line in the film, it feels like a plant because it's like, oh, that sorts out plot problems. But it was the bit where she goes, you know, the weather can change. It's the air pressure. Mm-hmm. We said that because we are going to play with that because that's actually what it's really like. Everything that Liz, the ranger says is absolutely true because obviously the writer did his research and wants everybody to know how well researched he has. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, you just wait. We did a scene. One of my favorite shots is when the two characters are walking towards camera with those those misty hills. And he's like, she's like, do you really expect to find anything? Because I know we'll find something. And it's like a 20 second walking shot with them both, which is a miracle that nobody disappeared down potholes. Um, mm-hmm. But we filmed two over shoulder shots and it wasn't raining. It wasn't misty. It was just meant to be a scene on the moor. And working the takes, let's try something different. Let's try and bring this up, bring this down. And we kind of got it and I went, all right, let's get like the main wide walking back, you know, steady camera shot. And it started to rain. <laughs> and everybody was like, we're done then? Like, you've got the shots. It's cancel on the counter rain. And then the mist of the hills started to thicken. And I was like, no, we need to start again. Like, <laughs> we need to go again. And I was the most hated person. <laughs> And well, well, you are the director. You're not doing it right. If <laughs> <laughs> I just knew that, and I won't lie, they didn't have to pretend to be miserable. <laughs> like that was natural. It's like the tenth time we did it was different shots, but the same scene. And it was like the tenth take, and it was raining, and they were getting drenched and miserable. And I'm like, got a movie now. Like <laughs> <laughs> this is the movie. <laughs> Well, now you're taking away from the performance level. I actually yeah. just really did torture them. That's all. <laughs> um, I did, nobody enjoyed being on the moor except for probably me and you, the cinematographer. <laughs> but in that with the way that's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. they can't see what we're seeing. They're just feeling it, aren't they? So. Yeah. But it's weird you say that because um, – Sorry to go off on, but like the yeah. acting was – the cast, the ensemble, that was probably – as a debut feature filmmaker, that was the hardest thing for me was to have – like a great cast, keep an eye on all of them, make sure 
everybody's getting their moment and um, they're bouncing off each other organically and stuff like that. Also, their acting processes are different. So David M. Robertson, is, he wasn't trained. He was self-trained and he the main actor. And so he had more of a method approach. So when he was walking around for a couple of weeks, he was like Bill. Yeah. Like his jaw. Like I know him as a friend. I've known him in the same – we grew up in the same city. Well, he's from where I made films in the city I was from. And he – he his old demeanor changed in the movie where like Sophia Laporte could be like Mackie D's and then <laughs> he would just go back into like this tragic character and David would be like what the hell like <laughs> I'm, I've got a fictional kid in my heart right now and you're thinking about food like it was, it was really really exciting to see those two types of actors bounce off each other that's too fun I want to jump back because you're talking about the camera work and getting the right shots and everything. There is uh, most of the film is like third person shooting, but you do incorporate some first person. Was there ever like discussion uh, about doing the whole thing and doing the first doing a first person throughout the film? And was it just you couldn't figure out how to do that with the setup? So this is if anybody's seen the film and likes it, I still think my opinion here is going to split the room. So the treatment that Paul wrote before my involvement was completely found footage. So yeah, you're like, it, and, well, it, ha it has some of that feel to it, especially everything. Uh, uh, the one character uh, blanking on her name there, Claire, uh, Claire's uh, constantly strapping on the camera and yeah. all that. So it felt like that was the direction it yeah. wanted to go. So, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I have, so much respect for the found. This sounds like a bill, but it's absolutely true. I have got a, such a respect for found footage movies like VHS, the first one. Um, obviously, Blair Witch, the hidden gem that's not so hidden now, like Mungo. I knew that that's not where my abilities and my brother, the cinematographer's abilities, would shine the most because mm -hmm. we didn't grow up going, that's our shit. Like we grew up with the classic horrors. Mm -hmm. So we actually pulled back our style to to respect more of the 70s style horror where we didn't get too flashy with the camera. And so that we knew that for me and my brother to just work naturally, it wouldn't be found footage. But there were aspects of the treatment that I went can only work in found footage format, particularly the ending. Mm -hmm. So again, my comments, if you've seen the movie, this is gonna some of you are gonna be like, great choice, others will be like, Chris. So I didn't change anything about that ending except for like one tiny detail. Cause I like, cause the reason I did the film is the ending took me back. Like I liked the character development. I loved all that, but the ending kind of shook me a bit. And I heard somewhere famous director say, if it, if it scares you to make the movie, you should do it because it means somebody hasn't done it that way yet. Uh, or they haven't seen that yet. And that ending really did that for me. So that was my agreement. And so it was just about going, uh, how do you incorporate what worked about the elements in the treat? Cause it was a treatment. It wasn't a fleshed out script yet. So, you know, a lot of things got added like the opening and stuff like that, that was not in the treatment. So in the treatment, the opening was literally Claire speaking to camera going, here's why I'm doing it. Here's mm -hmm. why I'm here. Here's who I am. And then it was like, the writer was like, shit, how do we get that out now? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. And so we you didn't want to be pigeonholed from then on. <laughs> Well, to be honest with you, if somebody said, Chris, we want to do a found footage movie with you, I'd be like, after shooting them more, like my my favorite horror aspects of the movie is the ending. So I'm like, I, I'd go for it, yeah. Hmm. But then I was like, I know that. So I really responded to like the Thornley scene with the maps and stuff like that. Yeah. I was like, I know, how, I know how I want to shoot that. Even without a budget, I can shoot that. So with found footage, I'd have lost all of that. And I didn't like the idea of Claire being the type of person that goes, oh, I've bought, because I obviously wanted to do the drone shots of the moor and show you the vastness of it. Even though it's oppressive, it's vast. And the mm -hmm. last thing I wanted was a character to go, oh, I've got a drone. I'm learning how to use it. Here's my license. I'm going to send it up uh... there. That was like, oh, <laughs> why you got that there? I just didn't need that scene in my life. Mm -hmm. So um, having it just interspersed cheekily allowed me to have my cake and eat it. Whether you think <laughs> it worked is up to you. But yeah, like getting in the local townsfolk. Um, do you know the the mother, the Yorkshire mother? That's the AD's actual mum. Ah, <laughs> nice. Because uh, we just went, yeah, she'll be able to do this. Like she's not an actor, but you just go, you can't judge us for not being Yorkshire if you 
see her. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that allowed us, that's the Lake Mungo style, isn't it? Those little talking heads. So you got to get a sense of the place even more then. Because um, here's another aspect I didn't want to do with found footage, which is like, so who edited this? Was it a tape they found in the bog? Right. Because like, mm-hmm. I, the ending, uh, how do you get the ending? But I don't want people to think, we can overthink it, but like, oh, so who got that? Who found the tape? Right. And who edited it? And who right. did that? And I'm like, I don't want to go there. No, it it works for me by not being completely found footage. I'll admit that the early on, some of the earlier films with the found footage, you're right. You know, full props and respect to them and everything. But yeah. the problem I have with the films is I feel that now the trope is a little tired. And it the biggest problem I always have with any found footage film is why are they still recording? Yeah. <laughs> no, and, it's true. And th- that's, yeah. that's the main question. The second one was like, how do you end a found footage film originally? Is mm-hmm. it going to fall on its side? Do they drop it? And you just kind of go, I don't, that's not the question that interests me. Obviously we did our version of, we had to do our version of that. Um, yeah. And we just went, we're not dropping it. We're not dropping a tripod. And I'm not saying they don't work. It's just they've been done now. So we can't repeat it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so um, yeah, I just didn't want to, it's it, yes, you say it's a bit tired, but also because we're so aware of it, it's become restrictive in some ways too. It's really hard to be original in that genre that's been done so well. Mm. So you go, all right, got to go against the giants immediately. Like, right? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's part of what we enjoy about uh, some of the uh, independent and lower budget films is you actually are making the decisions that will now impact the way that the story is told and presented unlike the bigger budget stuff that have an entire army of people all providing input and can change direction on a dime so test audiences and, test audiences yeah. rewrites re reshoots you have to go with your vision because that's what you have time and budget to do <laughs> and well yeah there's restrictions so we can get a more ways. raw experience out of that too Yes. So yeah, I think you you are right. It is going to be raw. There's no outside influence, but because we're such a small team of people that like, we still have to like, that we have to still committee a little bit amongst ourselves. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it's always going to be a group project, but it's, it, yeah. there's one thing when it, we're talking dozens yes. to maybe a hundred or thousands yeah. playing yeah. a part in it. So it comes no, off I, more genuine this way. No, I, yes. So, yeah. So you're seeing us in, you're seeing this film as if it's like a little bubble. Nobody knew it was happening. And then we came mm-hmm. out unfiltered, untouched. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And it's by Yorkshire filmmakers. So there's no like, um, like even I was going to say American, Australian, but I mean, like, like a London filmmaker didn't have a say in this. So it was Yorkshire location and story by Yorkshire people. So yeah, you can't, can't, get better than that in terms of a uh, no, you did score. great work with, with with what you had there yeah that was great mm-hmm. well it's weird because I, I don't know if people who are northern watching it'll go i know that coffee shop because it's, <laughs> it's quite a famous coffee shop I, did, <laughs> I didn't want to there's one more aspect of the film that i definitely wanted to touch on because we we mentioned it in the review and that is the actual uh editing of the film uh, there are times and and both and music i suppose we should we should mention the the actual soundtrack of the film as well with this they kind of go hand in hand there were times where the music was building and the way the shot was lingering tom and i both said we're waiting for like the jump scare yeah and the jump scare ends up being the next scene i mean it was a scene change <laughs> it was yeah. that sort of uh and that i i really dug that i i enjoyed that sort of Okay, we're gonna give you here comes something. Oh nope, just scene change. I, I it was almost like you were kind of like toying a little bit with the audience, but still giving them what they wanted. Well, it's no, it's interesting you say that. So it's like we knew that we were slow burn, so we were saving all the juice for as a reward for going along with us. But you kind of go, we want to sustain dread, but we don't want it to be one tone, one level throughout so you kind of go well everybody's waiting for the hammer to fall 
let's at least bring up the hammer into the conversation every now and then. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, is this the hammer moment? No, it's not. But I think it's <laughs> weird. You, you can, I suppose you can be frustrating with that, but I feel like when you do a, a fully verified jump scare, you release tension. You do release some tension. You go, oh, finally, you hit me with it. Like, mm-hmm. I was waiting for it, and you hit me with it. Thank God. But when you build up a jump scare, you go, not now, maybe later. You go, you, okay. Like, it's it's coming, but not now. And hopefully that helps you just go, oh, this is keeping me on the up and down roller coaster ride without without losing any dread and tension. Because, it, like I say, it's a slow burn. So. I'm hoping that's what we achieved with it. I know exactly the moments you're talking about. You're on about with the slow zoom in on the chair. Mm-hmm. All that kind of, yes, yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. yeah. I, I, actually, I think you nailed it right out of the gate with the opening sequence when we got young Claire and, and Danny at the shop. And there's always that shot down that alley just behind the shop. It's eluding that something's there, but nothing's there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the, that got me. I was in, in. I'm hooked at that moment. Nice. It, it, it's like you, you're you're giving me enough to go. Horrible things are going to happen. Just not right now. You're not getting it. But you're, <laughs> we're going to creep the hell out of you while yes. you, you make your brain go. What the hell's coming out of the wood up the alley? <laughs> well, we have that. I call it like the Terminator Two problem, where if you've read about our film and want to see it, you kind of know where that opening is going to go. Yeah. So you kind of want to at least give the even the because the horror fans want to be scared. It's just they're chess mm-hmm. players. They love playing chess. You just have to be good at chess. So they're like, "Come on, hit me with a good one." So we we know we're already kind of screwed with the opening if you already know enough about the film. So you want to at least say like, "But we can still play chess." Do you know what I mean? Like, no, you know, I, like. I, I, and you set that up. It was effective. Yeah. I, I enjoyed that rather quite a bit. Yeah. We oh, know the nice. film isn't called The Alley. It's called The Moor. Yeah. So we- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no, nothing. We, we know in our hearts nothing is going to happen here, but you're setting something up and you could creep the hell out of us right now. And, and we're still going to be all in. But you, you let you let it linger and then you take it away and you're like, oh, wait, oh, now I need more. Now I need more. <laughs> Well, that's what's what's nice about if you're if you love watching films, you're willing to be taken on the journey, even if you can kind of even sometimes predict it. So, like, it's always like, but what if? Like, you're kind of going because let's be honest, the opening sequence, you're thinking about the safety of both children, but mm-hmm. when you focus on the alley, you you your focus is 100 percent on Claire, and so that was that was obviously the intention because you didn't want it to. I know the outcome of it. So when you're telling it, you don't want to act like I know the outcome of it. You want to obviously go, it could be this, could be this, could be this. <laughs> so the fact that you you got that is that's that's really good feedback. Thank you. Now we we really enjoyed the film. And I think Tom, it sounds like the more that you've stewed on it, the more you've actually come kind of around and enjoy it even more than you you did originally. I think Chris called it the more also, just so that the more you say more, it just keeps <laughs> ingraining the film. <laughs> <laughs> my critiques are what they are it didn't take away at all from the enjoyment of the film it, it, like i said my the areas where i wanted a little bit more is just my brain wanting mm. to dig in deeper on the topics that 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 are being brought up the the iconography what is the demon what, what is the thing that is taking you, all of these things? I want more, uh, and then I you want, want the uh, to come in and fight it. <laughs> you want the you want the graphic novel and the uh, short films and everything that kind of go but, alongside it. <laughs> but that's effective. That's what it is. Like yeah. it, the Blair Witch Project when it first came out, did the exact same thing for me. It is a big giant question mark of a of a movie. So I started digging into anything that anyone ever come with, came up with related to it. So. This well, you is went the in blind as well. I want that. <laughs> no, no, no. But the thing is, don't forget, like you said in your review, like you went in completely blind. So you probably had an expectation of what you thought it was going to be. Sure. So I think most people who know nothing will be like, oh, it's going to be about the killer. And yeah. if that's what you're really into, then this isn't the film. So it's it's it takes a moment to adjust if you absolutely know nothing. Because serial killers in movies are really big like that's a big part of it and if we go well we're not doing that one today they go wait wait what okay and you go no we're focusing on the victims and you go okay so it's a different spin and that's obviously Uh gonna it's gonna confuse it's not gonna confuse it's gonna be an adjustment for people who who know absolutely nothing about it 
So I, I, I appreciate it. I, I was, I, I like the fact. What really made me happy is you both. You discuss. There was a really interesting discussion, and that's how films survive and live on is mm-hmm. through discussion. If you guys went, I like it, I liked it. All right, bye. Like there was actually reasons you both had to to, to debate on, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> this podcast was born out of us doing this since we were sixteen. So. <laughs> I'm jealous. Yeah, we. But, you know, yeah, anybody about- that helps us generate more conversation, we're all for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's the problem with that. You you literally have said the problem. I'm actually suffering right now. So you went, well, the the, the Blair Witch Project asked you know asked more questions and left no answers, and everybody was really puzzled. And I felt lately I've been doing like a, a tour around the UK, different cities of doing Q and As, and the ending's intention is meant to be just like hammer drops, cut to credits, yep. and you go, wait, what? Yep. And then, but what they have at Q and A is midway through, people kind of like blinking, like what? I walk up and they go, "Hey, Chris Cronin." And I go, "Hey, everyone, I'm actually a really friendly guy. How's it going? Let's talk about it." And they kind of it loses that magic because ah. they go, "I'm not miserable anymore. It's a movie." <laughs> and I just say, "Stop sending me on Q and A's, guys." <laughs> like, you just gotta start going in. The question is the point. <laughs> oh man! Either people be like. Yes, or I'll start getting popcorn bags. Wait, come on, you live in the same world we do. That you're always going to get that, no matter about what you're talking about. As long as, man, as long as there is engagement. If you yes. just, if you just, which will happen, but if you just kind of, eh, not for me, turn it off, and there's no more discussion. That's the death of a movie. Yeah. So. If there's frustration in a good way of like, what the hell do those stones mean? Yep. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. So. No, and that's just it. You left me haunted. So <laughs> you, you did it. <laughs> Thumbs up for the audio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll have to parentheses. He put his thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, I really appreciate you coming on and discussing the film with us. Uh, this Watching a, a film and enjoying a film is it's always fun. Kind of learning more about the films that you enjoy from the people behind the scenes for me, especially I uh, is always a thrill. And I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come talk with us. No, I've been really enjoyed talking to you guys. Thank you. I, I enjoyed the podcast. Thank you. I, I I'm glad that you did. And, uh, it, please, you know, keep us up to date on any future projects. Cause we definitely want to kind of, I, I will definitely keep your, your name high on my list of uh, names to, to follow, you know, their, their careers and everything. Cause I, being that this was your first feature length film and everything. And I feel like you kind of, you really hit it out of the gate uh, on, on it. I definitely want to see where you go from here. Uh, I, I think Tom probably uh, yes. you're saying you agree. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank so, you very much. I was I was blessed with a good team and a good riot, so I really appreciate that, guys. No, uh, it was our our pleasure uh, speaking with you, and we we hope we get a chance to talk with you again, mm. especially on your werewolf uh, uh, murder spree uh, movie. Yes, <laughs> which way will we go? Let's find right. out. Right, what? the Wuthering Heights, Heights werewolf romance CSI. that breaks down into werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just put him in a hat and just grab him? <laughs> yeah. See, now you're going back to comedy and you want to break away from that. Sorry, Lute- yes. Lieutenant Damn. Heathcliff is a werewolf. Run, Kathy. <laughs> oh, break, break into song. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and yes, let's make it a musical too. Yeah. 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 Hey, sorry, it's the more I just, I, you know, I, you know, such a rollicking comedy that I have to just keep it going. Uh. <laughs> Seriously, though, we do yes. recommend going out and checking out the more if you get an opportunity and hope, uh, you know, it'll be on uh, streaming or, or something wherever you you happen to to be soon. Again, Chris, thanks so much. No, thanks very much, guys.